In addition to the Pacific coastal areas of California and Washington State, the New Madrid Fault Zone, which runs under the Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky border area, is expected to experience a strong earthquake at some unknown date in the future. But based on building designs, we have to question the awareness and preparedness of people living along the Mississippi River. Because of the length of time since the catastrophic events that struck the area back in 1811 and 1812, future scenarios invite something of a dismissive attitude among members of the public and their elected officials. Today on the Vantage Point, we're taking a look at arguably the most powerful earthquake in American history, as well as the what-ifs of another event of similar magnitude. I hope you'll join me. In 2003, the United States Geological Survey revised its forecast. The recent forecast projects a 7 to 10 percent probability that an earthquake in the range of 7.5 to 8.0 will occur in the New Madrid Fault Zone sometime in the next 50 years. The probability quadrupled for a quake in the moderate to strong range. Clearly, the fault lines that produced the 1811 and 1812 quakes have not healed themselves. Tension still exists among and along those tectonic fractures. In 1811 and 1812 was a time when pioneers like Daniel Boone were hunting the eastern forests of Missouri. It was also a time in which Tecumseh and other leaders of the Shawnee, Kickapoo, and Winnebago tribes sought intertribal unity to resist the ever-encroaching advance of immigrants into their lands. Few observations of members of Native Americans or Native tribes that lived in the area were recorded for posterity. So their experiences and reactions to the earthquakes were not well documented. Still, in 1811 and 1812, the number of people living in the areas immediately west of the Mississippi was extremely small in comparison to the population density of today. The two largest settlements between New Orleans and St. Louis were New Madrid, Missouri, and Natchez, Mississippi. Because the quakes more directly impacted New Madrid, its name was affixed to the sequence of quakes that rocked that part of the Mississippi River Basin. Whereas P and S waves ripple through deep bedrock at a high velocity, surface energy such as Raleigh and Love waves move much slower. They were the kinds of movements that leveled New Madrid, Missouri. Those surface waves create two distinct patterns of motion that when combined create more instability for any structures that sit astride them. In a manner similar to swells that move along the surface of, the ocean, of an ocean, Raleigh waves create up and down elliptical surface movements. The shaking of a building hence resembles a cork bobbing up and down, toppling backward and forward throughout the event. On the other hand, a love wave causes side-to-side -side motion. It would take an exceptionally well-designed building with structural flexibility to simultaneously withstand these opposing forces of motion. In 1811, such was unheard of along the western frontier. Most of the scholars who have written on topics related to the three main earthquakes that occurred along the Mississippi River 210 years ago owe a great deal of gratitude to the considerable effort and reconstructed model of Otto W. Nutley, a professor of geophysics who worked at St. Louis University. Nutley used period newspaper accounts that detailed the sequence of earthquake events to draw an isosizable map of the first of three principal shocks. He also noted that there were upwards of 200,000 aftershocks, and remarkably, most of them were in the moderate to strong range, which would cause extensive damage in cities located along the, that portion of the Mississippi River if they existed at the time. Nutley concentrated on the three largest that he thought probably registered between 7.1 and 7.4 on the Richter scale, respectively. His map reflects an unusually large felt area that extended to the Atlantic coastal area of the southeast. Imagine Myrtle Beach with an earthquake shock and shaking people. His examination of old newspaper accounts apparently did not yield many stories about damage to the west of the epicenter. Given the time period and the absence of newspapers and a few settlements located west of the Mississippi, he had little to study. 
The New Madrid earthquakes were among the most intense tectonic events in the natural history of North America. Most are, are east of the Rockies, they were certainly the strongest. The area of strong shaking was 10 times the size of that which was affected by the 1906 San Francisco quake. In addition, physiographic or landscape features near the epicenter were also altered. Real foot, the only natural lake in Tennessee, was formed by the third event. According to Nutley, the first big one occurred in northeastern Arkansas at just past 2 a.m. on December 16, 1811. It was followed by a large aftershock at 7.15 a.m. Based on first-hand accounts, Nutley decided that this was the largest of the 200 or so aftershocks. On January 23, 1812, the second major quake reverberated from an epicenter in southeast Missouri. Finally, the third quake occurred along the Real Foot Fault in northwest Tennessee and southeast Missouri on February 12, 1812. The area that experienced extensive damage was large and impressive. Based on accounts of witnesses, the first quake caused structural damage throughout an area, get this now, 600,000 square kilometers or 231,600 square miles in size. To put this in perspective, the area of structural damage was twice the size of Arkansas and Missouri. According to the United States Geological Survey, USGS, it is well, reasonably be well established that the public was alarmed throughout a 2.5 million square kilometer or 965,000 square mile area. That's 30% of the contiguous United States. People were made aware of this by shaking. Wow. These quakes caused surface areas of the region to rise and fall. Islands in the Mississippi River disappeared and shifts in the riverbed generated waves that traveled north of the epicenter, creating the illusion that the mighty Mississippi was forced to flow, flow backwards or northward. Cracks appeared in the landscape and landslides were observed along river bluffs and hills. In areas of subsidence or sinking, aquifers were broken and new springs were formed. As I mentioned just a few seconds ago, the most obvious impact that occurred on the landscape was the formation of Real Foot Lake in Tennessee, where its subsidence was between 1.5 meters to 6 meters, that's between about 5 feet and 20 feet deep. As a result, the only natural lake in Tennessee sits in the depression created by an earthquake. While the impact on the landscape was severe, the fact that few towns were located in the immediate area meant fewer deaths. Only one death was reported, and it was from collapsing structures in New Madrid, Missouri. However, cabins and chimneys were thrown down as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio, some 400 miles away. Similar structural devastation occurred in Kentucky and Tennessee. Earthquakes and volcanoes have always plagued humanity. Perspectives and responses to this force of nature have progressed from supernatural causes to knowledge of energy waves, as well as accurate maps depicting seismic activity and fault zones. We know where deadly tectonic events have occurred and where they are likely to happen in the future. Forecasting future events, however, is fraught with ambiguities because tension exists along hundreds of fault lines. But how do we measure it? And at what level of tension do earthquakes occur? We just don't know. As we have seen in the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 and the New Madrid earthquakes of 1811 and 12, earthquakes can occur in places that the general public does not fully expect, although geoscientists have mapped most of them. As is the case with uh, images of Tornado Alley being situated exclusively in the Great Plains, imagery of earthquakes seems to be focused on California and the Pacific uh, Ring of Fire. Places like Southern Caribbean Basin, the Indian Ocean Basin, and the Mississippi River Valley are not on the seismic radar screens of many people outside of the circle of scientists who study and write about such things. If the forecasts issued by the USGS are accurate, the future does not bode well for people living along the central Mississippi River or its major tributaries. With the rise of cities like Memphis, Tennessee, West Memphis, Arkansas, and Jonesboro, Arkansas, Cape Girardeau and St. Louis, Missouri, as well as Paducah and Owensboro, Kentucky, there is no precise way to accurately predict the casualty rate that would result from a major event like 1811 and 1812. 
there's a great deal of variability in building designs and construction materials used in the region. One thing is for certain, brick and mortar apartment and office buildings may resist strong winds like in a tornado, but they will crumble under a moderate to powerful earthquake. Predictions can be made about when the next big one will hit, but they're just educated guesses. The faults under the heavily populated Mississippi River Basin have nailed themselves and tension still exists in this building along those fault lines. If they snap, as they did in 1811 and 1812, the result will be a catastrophe of biblical proportions. In the final analysis, however, some anxiety can be a good thing if it causes people to build flexible buildings like the Japanese have been doing for decades. Thanks for joining me today. If you liked the video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And I look forward to seeing you again here on The Vantage Point.